Good morning. I'm so glad you could be with me today in God's Word in the midst of the Unfolding the Word study series. We're in the midst of the study of 1 John, and yesterday we began looking at the second chapter, and I'm going to pick up our reading in the same place. Chapter 2 of 1 John, beginning in verse 1. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. The context has been the context of walking in the light, as he is in the light, and the reality that as we seek to do that, we will stumble in sin. The first chapter ended with the emphasis of acknowledging that truth, not denying it to ourselves or to God, and then confessing our sin, agreeing with God about it, acknowledging it and turning from it, and seeking his forgiveness in the midst of it. The second chapter began, and we were looking at this yesterday, with the fact that the promise of forgiveness that is rooted in confession, rooted in these great messages about walking in the light as he is in the light, the promise of forgiveness is never intended by God to undercut a commitment to holy living. In other words, we need to accept that sin is a big deal, not somehow not a big deal, because of a misunderstanding perhaps of grace. Sin is a big deal in the life of the believer. Not a big deal because somehow as a result of sin, a truly regenerate child of God would lose their salvation. No. But what they do lose is very significant if they are not dealing with sin properly. They are displeasing God, first of all, in their relationship with God and deepening friendship with God is disrupted. They are going to be struggling with guilt. It will always hurt them when they sin, and it will always hurt other people when they sin. And it will always lead to God's disciplinary hand in our lives if we're not dealing with sin properly. So sin is a big deal for the life of the believer. Now, what he says to us is, don't take sin lightly, but when you do stumble, in your efforts to walk in the light, when it doesn't always work out, when you do stumble, take hope, because there are two things operating. <laughs> if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but the sins of the whole world. <laughs> Forgiveness is possible for the believer. Confession of sin works, and relationship with God can be restored and deepened despite periodic stumbling on the believer's life. Number one, because Jesus Christ is our advocate. That's the way it uh, is translated here. We have an advocate with the Father. This word advocate in verse 1 translates the Greek word parakletos. Now, literally, the word parakletos is a description of someone who comes alongside to help someone. It's used, by the way, about the Holy Spirit in John chapter 14, verse 26, where it says, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, the helper, in this case, the translation of the word parakletos, the paraklete, the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all I've said to you. Uh, Parakletos, one who comes alongside to help. Essentially, in the New Testament era, in the Koine Greek of which the New Testament was written, the word parakletos was used two ways in the Greek language. One way was the sense of being a counselor, a helper. That's how it is used in the implication of it, of course, in the John 14 verse that I just read to you. But the other meaning, which is a more defined meaning for it, is it was a description of a defense lawyer, to put it in modern terms, that one who would stand in our place to help us and plead for us in the midst of a situation where we were, we were appearing before the authorities, before the judges. So parakletos can also refer to the defense work, the defense lawyer. And it, of course, in that context, is how it's being used here. We have a defense lawyer. We have a parakletos before the Father. Jesus Christ is our advocate. He is the one who pleads our case before the Heavenly Father. 
Isn't that a wonderful truth that we have one who stands in our place? Now, by the way, this is often misunderstood, but please understand, he is not the parakletos for the unbeliever. There is no one who stands between the unbeliever and God <clears throat> to excuse and defend sin. No matter what an unbeliever may do in terms of rituals and religious activity or in terms of trying to do good works, nothing they can do can solve their sin issue. Jesus Christ is not their advocate. But for the believer, the redeemed child of God, he now, among many other things, assumes an advocacy role. He is our defense warrior. In Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25, it says, Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he ever lives to make intercession for them. <laughs> intercession is the idea of defense, pleading our case, bringing it before God. Now, what is the Lord Jesus' defense strategy for you and I as a result of those times that we stumble as children of God. Human lawyers essentially use two strategies in their defenses. Number one, they try to prove that their client is not guilty of the crime. If they can't do that, then the second defense strategy is to turn attention to extenuating circumstances that explains away the crime so that their client's not really guilty, or at least not as guilty as they would be otherwise. That's how human advocates, lawyers, seek to help their people. But understand, that's absolutely not what's going on with Jesus Christ, who is our advocate. He is not following that strategy he doesn't manipulate the evidence to try to make it look like we didn't stumble. He doesn't explore extenuating circumstances to explain away your sin or my sin. No, no. <laughs> he, cut, he steps in, he says, they've just admitted their sin. They've homo legeoed, 1 John 1, 9. They've agreed with us about it. They are sinners and they are guilty. They took this choice. But... But my blood covers that sin. His plea on our behalf, his petition, his intercession is, Gary sinned, yes, but he's repented and confessed and admitted it now. And since in April of 1967, he received the Lord Jesus Christ as his Savior, confident and resting in the work of Christ on the cross for him. His sin is covered by my blood. He did sin. There was no excuse for it. No extenuating circumstance to explain it away. But he's covered. He's covered. Isn't that astounding? And yet that's what this passage is telling us. I have one who pleads my case. He doesn't kind of cover over my sin. He doesn't explain it away. He doesn't try to... No, no. Sin is sin. Serious. An issue. But he received me as his Savior, and therefore my blood covers that sin. The plea that Christ makes on my behalf as my advocate, my parakletos, overrules my guilt. It overrules the accusation against me, and it brings me to the point of being able to benefit from the forgiveness earned at the cross. It overcomes the accuser's case. Well, the, answer, the question comes up, well, who's accusing you of anything? Well, first of all, my conscience is, but more importantly, there's an enemy of my souls that is accusing me. In Revelation chapter 12, verse 10, in talking about Satan, listen to these words. He is the accuser of the brothers. He accuses them night and day before God. And you and I give him lots of material for his accusation, <laughs> for his prosecution. What day have you gone through that there's been no attitude, no word, no action, that was displeasing to God. No, no, we give him lots of material 
to bring against us. We have a great accuser. In fact, by the way, the name Satan means in Hebrew accuser. <laughs> he is the accuser. But his day and night accusations about you and about me before the Heavenly Father are offset because we have an advocate. And as Hebrews 7 said, as I read to you earlier, Hebrews 7, 5, chapter 7, verse 25, consequently he's able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him since he ever lives to make intercession for them. <laughs> His Satan's day and night accusations are offset by day and night defense at the hand of the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. What could be more astounding, more amazing, more wonderful? Never get used to it. Be humbled about it. And come back and join me tomorrow as we look at the second part of his work, his propitiation that makes all of this possible. God bless.